A colorful group of islands in the middle of the Atlantic, a small remaining part of the former British Empire. On Bermuda, shorts are the official dress code. Traffic tickets are delivered by boat. And the favorite food is kale. Bermuda. The crown jewel in the Atlantic. Bermuda has 65,000 inhabitants. The group of islands is a British overseas territory. Every year, the Bermudians celebrate the birthday of their queen in the capital of Hamilton. Tanya Smith and her bandmates do a rehearsal of their performance one week before the big parade. It's kind of like dancing. You listen to music and you're kind of moving. So when we're, when we're marching, it's kind of the same thing. We're playing the music and your feet are just... However, people who are out of step when we're playing, that makes you question though. Thank you. Bermuda has an army of 700 with a small budget. There's hardly any money, even for the sheet music. <laughs> Bursting music. <laughs> Can't see anything. Army, fire brigade, and police attend the rehearsal. Bass drum, make sure you can see me. Major Dwight Robinson is the conductor and head of the military band, the only permanent employee. He needs to coordinate his band with the other units and doesn't want to make mistakes. We're a little rusty at the moment. Uh, it's the first time that they've actually played this kind of uh, performance. Typically, we, we do uh, hotel engagement, so the, the mood is a little little more relaxed. Now, with because it's a ceremonial parade, they're a little more switched on, so there's a little bit of anxiety there that we just, just got to overcome a little bit. The rehearsal begins following the lead of Dwight's band. The musicians reach their mark as planned. They'll stay there while the other units march up and down. At this time, we are preparing for the symbolic arrival of Her Majesty the Queen. As the Queen won't attend in person, the royal banner will be honored in her place. That's it. Now, a critique of the maneuver. <laughs> Not very. Um, but again, like I said, it's early days as far as our ceremony is concerned. And we've got a few new people that are seeing music for the first time. Uh, we've had two groups that didn't show up for the rehearsal this evening, so that kind of threw a spanner in our works. We were not expecting that. It is hard to play a piccolo against the wind. Because you're blowing this way over the hole, the wind's going that way over the hole. Okay, what can you say? It's, it's always a two -time. The shot wasn't part of the rehearsal. 
Hopefully, the eardrums weren't perforated. The weapon's safety obviously was off. The Bermudas are a holiday paradise, but the islands were strategically significant in history. They're the ideal stopover between Europe and the New World, as they are located about 1,000 kilometers off the North American coast. Trade routes could be controlled from here, which is why the British built fortresses on the island hundreds of years ago. British culture plays a significant part in everyday life. Everybody plays cricket. There are some similarities with the Caribbean, but Bermuda isn't part of them. The islanders emphasize that fact. They live in their own world. And in that world, Mark Suarez is something like the caretaker of all the ships. If there's a problem, he takes care of it. But today, his way to work is already a problem. Well, it could be pretty difficult. The current can run as much as 10 knots. We can make six knots. So uh, it's gonna be a slow process. Let's see how we go here. Here we go, Flats Bridge. It's ebb tide and this is the only outlet of the big sound in the middle of the islands. In the beginning, everything seems to go smoothly, but then it comes to a halt. Brawn against nature. Another try with a new technique, extreme towing. Hold on, hold on. No chance. In today's struggle, the sea has the edge on man. In St. George's in the north of Bermuda, Mark manages a small marina. He's the handyman, and his mother works as the concierge for all the big yachts. Morning. Morning, Mark. All right. Everything is good. Busy, getting ready for the next lot of yachts to come in. Okay. And we did have a call from uh, yachtsman who is anchored over, I believe, in the Convict Bay area, uh, tried to move and his anchor is firmly stuck, okay. uh, needs a diver. He's quite prepared to wait because he knows that we're busy. So. He's not going anywhere because he's stuck. And he can't go anywhere because he's <laughs> okay. stuck. That sounds good. Hello, Captain. At the pier, there's another order waiting for Mama Suarez. Thank you. Bye, thank you. OK, madam, I need two bouquets of flowers low flowers, white ones, just to put in the uh, tables, and must to be, I don't know, one, one meter, something long, but must to be white. Not an easy task on a Sunday, but Mama Suarez is well connected. Designer flowers. Oh yes, I'd like to place an order, please, for one of my uh, yacht clients. Orchids would be quite nice, and I need them ASAP, so any chance of delivery within an hour? You can have very strange requests. For example, if an owner's wife is flying in for the weekend and she decides that she wants a specific type of, uh, let's say, vanilla ice cream, 
and they might not sell it in Bermuda, then they will fly it in from Miami. And if she's only here for two days, that's quite a big order to get a pint of vanilla ice cream. Just a little example. Fuel tankers arrive at the door. The yacht collects diesel fuel for its passage to Europe, 60,000 liters. They need to take their time so that the fuel in the tanks doesn't ignite. Fire damage would be quite expensive. The yacht cost about $20 million. We need now one and a half hour to fill 20,000 20, liters. If everything is okay now with the speed. Now we are filling uh, 200 liters per minute. On this single passage, the yacht consumes more fuel than most car drivers in their lifetime. Bermuda is just another world. Same goes for nature here. There are hardly any mammals, but a lot of birds and a special species that doesn't exist anywhere else. Biologist Jeremy Maderos has dedicated his whole life to it. The cajal really you know, has been a bird of mystery. In fact, it was called the ghost bird here because for a long time, everybody thought it was just a myth, like a legend, more or less. And uh, it's because it appears mysteriously only at night in the dead of winter, you know, in November and December. White-tailed tropic birds are everywhere, but the Bermuda petrel hardly ever shows. The cajau, as it's called here, was considered extinct until some remaining specimens were discovered. To protect the remaining 18 breeding pairs, dedicated bird lovers rebuilt a complete island, none such island. They killed all the rats and established the native vegetation. Jeremy visits the island every day during breeding season. He weighs and measures the fledglings so that he can immediately notice if something is wrong with the population. The birds and their eggs were almost completely exterminated. They got eaten by imported ship rats and hungry seafarers. Meanwhile, there are more than 100 breeding pairs raising their breed in artificial caves, birds with special skills. You see the hooked bill has the tube nose on top and in the nostrils are glands uh, that actually, they can drink seawater directly and um, the glands act like a, like a desalination plant. They actually extract the fresh water from the seawater and then they will sneeze out the drops of concentrated brine of salt that's left. Jeremy doesn't consider his work as strictly scientific. I'm a father, I have two children of my own, and I feel a bit paternal towards them. You know, I, I do feel quite a responsibility, um, not only for the species, but for individual birds, and especially here in Nonsuch, these are kind of special because all of the, uh, the parents of these, these chicks here are birds I raised by hand myself, and they've all come back, and now they're raising their own families. So I, I guess I consider myself like a godfather to them. Scientists have researched the Bermuda petrel for 40 years, but only in the last year they made more discoveries than ever before, thanks to a new sort of camera. the Cajal Cam. It's changed our whole understanding. It has already told us many new things about, uh, you know, the, how the, the adult Cajals feed the chicks. So we're pretty excited. So every day, Jeremy is able to watch the petrel's private life. This will help him if he's required to feed a fledgling again. what we've seen is that it takes about 10 minutes of preening by the adult to calm the chick down enough so that feeding can actually begin. Uh, because it, it just can't do it successfully. It's just like the chick is like, feed me, feed me, feed me. And it's just, 
too enthusiastic, you know. I can relate because I'm five foot seven and my son is uh, six foot three. And uh, there's times when, you know, I come in and it's like, what's for lunch, Dad, <laughs> and everything. So I, I, I can sympathize with the adult. You've got to work with them a bit, use a bit of psychology and calm them down <laughs> first to, to feed him because he eats about as much as three of me, you know. And there's another discovery. Nobody could imagine how the fledglings could train their wing muscles before they left their nest from one day to the next. The caves seemed too small for that. We had no idea until this camera actually, sh you know, revealed the secret life of the Kahau in the darkness, you know, which we just have never been able to see before. Men in shorts are very common in the streets of Hamilton, the island's capital. Bermudas are the normal office attire. They originate from the British Army's tropical uniforms. The English sports shop has specialized in the sale of those shorts. Ronald Mon shops for new ones here. Back again. I need a new pair of shorts. You do? Yeah. OK, what color are we looking for today? The navy? The sports shop had 7,000 shorts okay. in 14 colors produced for this season. Yeah. Half of them and are already sold out. Before I do that, what about that darker green? That, that one's better, I think. OK. OK. People do think we look funny, and I, I guess uh, they think the same thing of a Scotsman in his kilt, you know, it, but it's, it's like a national dress for us. Um, what the, the normal reaction is, you know, can we take your picture? Or it looks so cute, can we take your picture? And uh, almost on a daily basis, you know, two or three ladies, one on each side, one with the camera and its picture, and then the net swapping positions. So we'll have three different people. I don't know what they do with the pictures, that worries me. <laughs> At the sports shop, the price for a pair of Bermudas starts at 40 Bermuda dollars. That's about 30 euros. It just seems a little, a little I loose see that. there, you yeah, see? Just, you just have yeah. maybe an inch or so right. Yeah. This problem can easily be solved by the in-house tailor one floor up. Hello, Mr. Jones. These are fine, I think, but uh, you know, the, the, oh, it's just a bit big on the waist. Ian Jones is an expert in Bermudas. The native Englishman doesn't only do the fitting, he also designed the house fashion. It's all nice and easy. Yeah, they, they, that feels better. They, they, they don't feel like they're going to fall down. Yeah. There are strict rules for Bermudas. Whoever wears them without knee length socks or combines them with lace up shoes becomes a laughing stock. We're only such a short distance from in the United States, and yet we've got our own culture, our own dress, our own style. It, it's a great thing, it really is. When the king and queen visited the island, the store owner gave Prince Philip a pair of Bermudas as a gift. Well, if you know anything about the Duke, he's got quite a dry humor. And when he looked at the president, he just said, what, you want me to drop my trousers here to try them? And if you look at the smile on our president's face, you can see it was quite a little witty anecdote to throw at somebody, you know. It just puts the crown on top, if you'll excuse the, uh, the pun. Ronald's shorts have been fitted now. Yeah, I think these feel, feel pretty good. Feel good? Yeah. Let's have a look at the back, yeah. make sure that the seat's all sitting in line. Yeah, the key thing to look for is this, all nice and flat across your seat. Oh, I feel like I'm in a pair of shorts that were made for me. You're all ready for a day's business, looking good. good. Life is expensive on Bermuda. Nearly everything must be imported, even the food. And the VAT is high. Apples are $1 a piece. A single melon costs $16. Not everyone can or wants to afford that. 
Therefore, some clever islanders came up with the idea of growing their own vegetables, like Suzanne Mayo. And her vegetables are in high demand. Well, we've had actually some, what we would call in Bermuda, night farmers lately, which is actually uh, thieves. So we had a lot of onions stolen. So lately we've been afraid that there have been more thefts. The gardening area belongs to the community. Every gardener leased a plot of about 15 square meters. They grow their vegetables organically, so thieves aren't the only threat to the amateur gardener's crop. Kale is especially popular with gardeners and snails. They harvest it throughout the year. Kale is very common here. Kale will just keep growing and growing. So it's one of those easy, always produces food, hard to kill, <laughs> easy crops, staple crops, I'd call it. Irrigation is the biggest problem for growing vegetables on Bermuda. There are very few wells, so the islanders need to collect rainwater. Buying water would be too expensive. Trying to earth up the uh, much tidier than me. These strawberries. Yeah. To give it more chance to, to grow. I don't buy vegetables for about nine to ten months a year. You know, only in the middle of the summer, say July, August, that I would buy greens from the supermarket or the stores. Mm -hmm. Because I generally grow what I need. It's hard to quantify in money terms, but um, it's it's a huge savings. Henry Thomas grows very little at home to save water. At the community garden, everyone pays his share to the water fund. It helps a lot, you know, especially with the water situation. Sometimes in the summer, when it doesn't rain for a long time, say three, four weeks, and depending on the amount we use, we sometimes have to buy water. My tank might probably take two to three loads, so that's about $750 if it goes down to the bottom, yeah, so that can be quite pricey. A water tank covers the whole area below the patio. Henry doesn't know its exact holding capacity. But the water level looks good today. That's enough for a while. Henry's water source is the roof, as it is for all people on Bermuda. He cleans it regularly. It's very important to keep the uh, gutters clean because um, you can have all kinds of things um, go in the tank. Everything that goes in is what comes out of the other end, you know, because we don't really have much in the way of filtration system. Sometimes you have dead birds or other things on the, on the roof, and you don't want that going in your tank. The lime layer on the roof is also supposed to purify the water. There are regulations on how a roof must be built on Bermuda. Gutters are mandatory so that each roof can collect as much rainwater as possible. Bermuda's colorful houses with their white roofs are the island's trademark. At St. George's, the big yacht still waits for its flower delivery. Gardner, how are you? Good. good. Thanks for the quick, speedy delivery. Yeah, no problem. Very good. Captain will be very happy with this. Beautiful. The captain ordered flat arrangements for the dinner tables, and now he gets towering plants. Will he be happy with that? Yep. Drop that overboard, that's my prized possession. Yep. That belongs to me. Got it. What do you think, Captain? Thank you very much. Nice. Nice. Good. Yes, very good. Excellent, you're welcome. Thank you. Take care. Okay, hope the guests enjoy them. It's good. Sometimes you cannot get exactly what you want. Today is Sunday, and then it's difficult to get, but it's good. You get flowers on
you get from the agents and you get uh, good service. It's enough, good enough and good service. The boat caretaker, Mark Suarez, is on his way to another assignment. We got a call from a yachtsman that said they're trying to leave Bermuda, but they can't move because the anchor seems to be stuck in something. So we're going to go and find out. Mark's going to dive down and see if we can find out what it's caught in. Hi, you guys running tide? So what do you think? Is it coming very short? Okay, it, there's one rock down there, yeah. and over the years, the anchor chains have kind of yeah. turned it into a mushroom shape. Right. I wouldn't be surprised. So the first thing, the best thing for us to do is just get in the water and go and have a look. They're familiar with the problem. Yeah. The anchor is free. That's not the cause. Both ends of the anchor chain lead to a rock. It's really stuck and can't be released by hand. We got stuck on Friday night, so we tried to get it on Friday night, and we couldn't. So we've been here, we've been stuck ever since. Now, Mark is their last best hope. which is the best place to pull on. Try and figure out which is the best spot. Yeah, I, mean, I just think with a bit of power, you might be able yeah. to yuck it out of there. Is Mark's boat strong enough for this task? It couldn't fight the current, and this rock may be an even tougher adversary. Mark pulls the anchor chain aboard with a rope putting all his faith in his engines. The chain moves, and so does the rock. Just one more bit of gas. Mark moves the anchor so that its chain doesn't get stuck again. Yeah, we put a few more down. <laughs> so, the rock's over there. Right. That's... Don't go that way. Can you put it right? <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Hey, mate. That's it for today. Time to go home. At Suzanne Mail's home, it's time for supper. She serves kale. This winter vegetable is available here throughout the year. lot of the more delicate grains, so the kale is pretty hearty and juice it, stir fry it, steam it, put it in soups, you can do just about anything with it. <laughs> I feel very sorry that you only eat kale once a year. That seems like a real shame. Does it need a frost then, to be harvested? It does. Okay. I would feel very aggrieved if I could only eat kale once a year, that's for sure. Suzanne throws it in the pan and serves it with chicken and sweet potato mash. And what does Suzanne's husband, Ayo, think of his wife's favorite veg? Kale's good. <laughs> Sorry. Do you, right. you, you, have a, huh? you feel like you have to say that? 
No, it's okay. It's a nice little, you know, staple leaf thing. I think it's very healthy. Shipping traffic slows down in Hamilton Harbor. At night, there's not much activity on the island. Next morning, it's a holiday on Bermuda, the Queen's birthday. But ornithologist Jeremy needs to work anyway. Fledglings are waiting to be fed. He moved them, separated them from their parents for a good reason, as their nests were in danger. This is the largest of the four original islands they are on, and we had a big hurricane in 2003 and it ripped the whole side of the island out, and that's where many of the original nest burrows that the, the Bermuda petrel nested in uh, were located, and they're very faithful to those original locations. And so they were trying for years to scramble in the rubble, and we could not rebuild them because the island was gone there. It was completely demolished. To avoid this happening again, Jeremy moved all the fledglings to Nonsuch Island this year. They memorized the location of their nests and will return there in four years' time to breed there themselves. Until they fledge, Jeremy needs to collect them and feed them with shellfish. Without this service, the little ones wouldn't survive. It's a big responsibility. Every day, from early November, through to about uh, the middle of June, I am out here on this island every day, rain, blue or shine. And there's times uh, when there's a storm warning and small craft warning and you know, it's blowing 50 or 60 knots and you have to come out here and do this. Jeremy defrosts the fish and squids shortly before feeding time. The food must be fresh so that the little ones don't catch germs. A fledgling eats about 50 grams per meal. Feeding goes slowly, and the animals don't always cooperate. Thank you. Just helps to calm them down after they eat a big thing like that. And wait for the burp, just like a baby. And then they're not gonna regurgitate it. It's like children. Some don't want to eat their broccoli and their carrots and stuff. And it's like, you must, you must eat your broccoli. But it's, I don't want to. Yeah. So it's, it's like children. Every single one is an individual. It's very different from any other. The little ones gain weight from day to day. Jeremy's decision to move the fledglings proved to be right. Even more hand-raised birds survive the first four years in comparison to those who stay with their parents. I'm just trying to be the best uh, stepfather as possible to make sure that they're fed and they, they go in very good condition. It's sort of almost like bringing back, you know, the dodo, you know, or bringing back a dinosaur from, from extinction because it was thought extinct for so long. It's just very exciting you know, to be part of that. Water guard Linnell Williams starts her holiday shift in Hamilton Harbor. Today will be busier than usual. Public holidays, we always expect a lot of people. And now we expect more because you have more people getting jet skis. Like every season, there's somebody that you never saw in the water before with a boat or a jet ski. The whole of Bermuda seems to be on water.
It's a peaceful celebration until someone races a jet ski near the shore where only five knots of speed are allowed. He doesn't stand a chance against the police. They quickly catch the traffic offender. I, I, I waited till I got off the gate. You were meters old. You knew you were supposed to be 100 meters old. I came out the gate. Oh, I took off as soon as I came out the gate. Can I have to slide one time, please? Just this once, a warning. Begging doesn't help. Like, I never break these. I've been on the water for 10 years. You never had to give me a ticket. Did you do it? Yeah. Are you going to enjoy the rest of your holiday? Yeah. Linnell sometimes even has to issue a ticket to a friend. It's just like policing anywhere else on land. You'll run across people that you know. And most of the time, if your friends know what you do, so they know if they're wrong, you have to deal with them. Um, the law is the law. I know of my friends, they know that if they're doing something and I have to speak to them that I'm just doing my job. They're not going to hold it against me. The military band has assembled in front of the parliament building. It's the Queen's birthday. It's showtime. A little bit nervous because today is actually like the most important parade that we'll be playing in. So hopefully my uniform's up to standard and I'm all shaved up and stuff. So. A bayonet is also part of the uniform. I don't know what it's used for. It goes on the... It's a hurdy thing for hurting. On your rifle? But we don't have rifles, so why, why do we have one? <laughs> just in case? Yeah, just in case. <laughs> Tanya Smith knows some tricks about how to spruce up her uniform. Secret weapon. It's quite an effort even though less and less spectators attend the parade. I remember as a kid, because my dad was regiment, so it was like, yes, I'm going to the parade, I'm going to see my dad march, and, um, you know, I was really big, the regiment stretched across Front Street, the cannons are going to go, and then I think over time, um, it lost that. We are part of the, um, the Queen's portion of the world, and, you know, everybody's ready to celebrate that holiday on Monday, but um, not to really pay tribute to the woman who's given us this. Bang! As you were, grow six inches. Bang! And a drum! Cut! Morning. Good morning. When we fall out, see if you can get your spike to point upwards as opposed to that way. Polish your belt brass this morning. Don't look like you did. Belt brass. To work on your boots too. Morning. Morning. Okay, you guys can on your trousers. Um, and this belt brass on this side. You can put it the other way around so that it actually holds your belt shut. Otherwise, it might fall off. Morning. morning. How are you? Good. Thanks, and you? I'm here. Polish your belt brass this morning? Certainly did. All right. Polish buckle on your bayonet frog this morning? No, Sergeant. Okay. You all have had plenty of warning. Plenty of warning. I know on several occasions I've said, if you don't know what to do, come and see me. And nobody has. All right? Now, come on. This is a parade. You're in number one, uh, number threes in your ceremonial dress. And it arms. They all need to do some touching up before the parade begins. The number of party boats on the water has increased. The mood is cheerful, and water policewoman Linnell Williams spots someone else who gets carried away. It's four people on a jet ski that is only approved to carry three. Hey, you guys. That's not the most sensible thing you're doing right now. What? 
Your vehicle is licensed for three persons. That ski has a sticker that says three persons, maximum three persons. All right, well, I'm gonna take them back. No, you're gonna take one and one. Off one's gonna and take come one off. Back. One's gonna come off. No, you'll take some back and then come back and get the other one. Or you can get a ticket. You can leave one body as rock. So I got life jackets on. The driver tries to comply, but not fast enough for Linnell's taste. Hello. Hello. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm dropping them off right here. Okay. You can leave two if you want. That's what I'm doing, so they don't and then you can take them. one. Right. It's a safety reason. And this is still a five knot area, so just be mindful as you go in. This is my idol. That's slow as I can go. Okay. All right. Taking a bath is punishment. That's Bermuda. The birthday parade in honor of the Queen starts at Hamilton's Front Street. The Queen won't be present, but her representative, George Ferguson, the governor of Bermuda, will take the salute. Basically, the governor is the head of state. He appoints the prime minister and the members of the Senate. He was appointed by the queen on the recommendation of the British government. The banner symbolizes the queen's presence. When the banner is taken down, the queen has symbolically departed. Banner drops, pass, miss. Standing still is hard. So uh, we're a marching band, essentially. So um, actually being in motion is good for us. And standing still is like, I mean, it didn't it work. Was not, it was no flag up. Kevin Simmons survived his baptism by fire. First parade done. Not too bad. Not too bad. Yeah, I had to make up a few parts. It wasn't too bad. Nobody knew. Besides for us. 